Yeah, the video production business can suck. I mean, it's fun, yeah. but uh, it costs a lot, mm-hmm. you know, to get all the gear and everything. Yeah. And um, actually, I'll have you pull the microphone closer. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, it costs a lot to get, all, you know, all the gear for it and all that kind of stuff. And then we don't live, like, the restaurant industry especially, I don't know, you know, how you guys have structured it. We'll get into that. But yeah. restaurant owners are not used to spending money. I mean, they are. But not on the stuff, especially that, not on content and on a lot, all the money it takes to get in and like a return on on like a like a visual investment, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, tell everybody who you are and what you do. My name's Nick. I'm currently a, a senior at Colgate, an economics major there, um, and I played on the soccer team as well. Um, so in the it was my sophomore year when everyone got sent home for COVID. Mm. Uh, we were home over the summer, so me and some of my friends, we were seeing just on social media, like all the, the restaurants that we grew up with. And there aren't many in Hamilton, mm-hmm. um, which is the town where Colgate is. Uh, there's maybe a dozen, 15 restaurants there, and they were just dropping like flies and, mm-hmm. and putting up GoFundMes and, and really trying to find out like any way that they could keep their business afloat. As I'm sure a lot of like the, the restaurant owners you've talked to, like yeah. that, that period of time was like especially troubling. Yeah. Um, and furthermore, there was no Uber Eats on campus. So that's like, there's just a very unique market where like they, they don't have Uber Eats because Uber Eats and Grubhub like eat away at their, their bottom line profits because they just take these huge commission percentages. So like mm-hmm. restaurants in, like New York City like have to work with them to like reach the customers because everyone else is. But in Hamilton, it's like, hey, there's 15 restaurants. Like let's band up and say like, kind of fuck these guys. Like, right. like we want to, we want to, you know, make our profits. Um, and so we approached them with like a, a unique model to like take no commission from the restaurants, hmm. um, which is kind of unheard of in in food delivery because you're not as profitable as a business. Yeah. Uh, but that was uh, our mission was always to help out the restaurants first and foremost. So then we we built a food delivery business, and then yeah, we're in our third full semester of operations right now. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Was it um, was it, was it a school project or was it just something that you all started? Um, no, it was, uh, it was, so there's an uh, incubator at Colgate called the Thought into Action Incubator. Okay. Um, and I've been involved in it since, um, at late my freshman year. I had no clue what I wanted to do. I was like working on some dinky, like music app, mm-hmm. but I just knew I wanted to kind of be in that space mm-hmm. and I loved working with entrepreneurial people. And so luckily I'd built up some connections there through this music app. Um, so that when the time came and I had an idea that was tangible and I wanted to build, they put me in contact with like the partnership of community development in Hamilton and some people around campus. And they had a lot of great connections that, that gave us funding um, and can kind of get us off the ground. But no, it was, it was completely like a business, yeah. starting a business. It wasn't for like just the school. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So there's, are there, there are three of you in the business? Uh, three founders, okay. um, myself, Adrian Vaughn, and Ibrahim Almansab. Um, and we just onboarded two underclassmen because our, one of our main missions for this semester was to build a team that's sustainable after we graduate. Mm-hmm. So the three founders were all seniors. We're all going to graduate. Fingers, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we, we wanted to, to onboard some new people to help operate and run this thing for next year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to what's going to happen after, at the end of the semester, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, tell us exactly, like, what does the business do? Definitely. So... It's, it's a very unique market. It's not super transferable um, to the rest, the rest of the U.S., but the way that Colgate is set up is it's the, the entire campus is built on a hill. Mm-hmm. And as a freshman and sophomore, you have to live up the hill, um, and there's no parking up the hill. So you have a consumer base of students who, mind you, are like all from like cities or mostly urban or populated areas where they grew up with Uber Eats, and mm-hmm. then they're coming to Hamilton, New York, which like is kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, and there's no food delivery, they don't have cars, and then to get downtown, it's like a 15, 20 minute walk there, and then to go back is, is just as long, and then, you know, and like some days it's like negative 20 degrees, like no one wants to <laughs> go do that. So um, there's, we kind of provided this connection between them and then the restaurants, mm-hmm. um, and so the restaurants were uh, looking for ways to kind of like reach more consumers, and then when, when COVID hit, everyone was, quarantine and they couldn't really leave and there wasn't much to do um yeah. so they could plan out where they were going to be and and our model we take all of the restaurants information and their menu items their pricing put it on a central website that we built mm-hmm. and then we've have contracted drivers so that when someone places an order um it'll automate an email out to like our drivers and our and our restaurants the restaurants will make the food the drivers will go pick it up and 
hmm. bing, 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 boom, delivery. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and so you guys built that system from scratch? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm not a comp sci major. None, okay. of our, <laughs> none of our partners know anything in that field. Yeah. So we built it actually to start with a third-party developer. Okay. Um, which kind of turned out to be a pain in the ass, to be frank, just mm -hmm. because they would build it, and then they're not on the team. So they leave and do other projects. And yeah. every time we would need a little bug fix or we want to change something in our business model, we'd have to go back to them and say, hey, like, here's 200 extra bucks. Can you do this thing, this hour worth of work? Yeah. Um, so over the winter break, we scratched that system, and I picked up Bubble, which is like a no to zero, like low to zero code website building tool. Yeah. And I just kind of rebuilt our whole thing from scratch in the course of a couple, cool. couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. And so now that, you know, if there's like a little issue or something that I can tweak it or we can make things that are a little more tailored towards Colgate than what the other guys can provide. Yeah. Yeah. Do me a favor, pull the microphone closer. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're, you're fine. Back, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can pull the microphone closer to you. Um, uh, the, the further away you are from it, the more echoey it gets. I can okay, still hear I got it, you. But, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there was during the like in the big like just before the pandemic, a, a friend of mine who owns a restaurant, um, and I were talking about starting a delivery. This was the delivery platform locally, mm -hmm. because it was just around the time that everybody was complaining about third party fees. You know, thirty percent commission yeah. in most cases. Absurd. Yeah, and um, and then the pandemic hit, and then we started talking about it again. And there is, you know, the biggest challenge for it is uh, getting the drivers and making for that model is getting the drivers and then making sure that you have enough drivers on at any one given time mm -hmm. that they can, you know, fulfill the demand for yeah. the orders, especially like we were going to do it in Syracuse. Um, and then uh, that and probably co the, the second, you know, I wouldn't say it's one and two, but another problem is having the platform that's, you know, has no issues. It's lossless, right? You know, or customer can get the menu, place the order, get the notification, go straight to the restaurant, straight to the driver. Mm -hmm. I found a software company that has a system in place, but it's, it's really meant for like, uh, you know, big rig, like 18 wheelers and stuff like, you know, companies like that that okay. do shipping. Yeah. And, and talking to them and going through their demo it was really, it seemed like it was going to, it would work for something like this. Order gets played, you know, all this, yeah. all the things you need it to yeah, do. Yeah. And it was going to, it was only $600 a month for the software, no matter how big you got. Wow. And so our thought was what I was trying to pitch to a couple restaurants. And then I just, I gave up on it because it was just going to be an extraordinary amount of work mm -hmm. was to create a co-op of sorts amongst the owners. So as more restaurants join, they would all be owners in this delivery business. They would all contribute a monthly fee to keep it going. Yeah. While but, benefiting from the delivery option. Yes. Yeah. But then there would be no, there would be no delivery fees mm -hmm. that any of them would pay. They would, part of their contribution would be to have one person that ran the business for them mm -hmm. to pay their salary and uh, cover the insurances and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of them were like, hey, we're interested if you build everything and then just kind of tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. But none of them were really interested in building it. So we never did anything with it. Yeah. It's, there's, a, there's a couple of tough things. So I think, I mean, you know, what, like just as well as I do, working in the restaurant industry where a lot of the owners are maybe a little bit behind on this, like quickly changing, especially in things regarding tech. Yeah. And they've been, you know, operating restaurants for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But things had to change with COVID. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's a costly business. There's like a bunch of different kind of things that are pulling you in different ways and you, you got to manage it like it all at the same time. What we did, which is unique and different than kind of most other food delivery platforms is, like you said, if you're staffing drivers 24-7, mm -hmm. they always have to be on call. That like just drains from your bottom line. And that's why a lot of these like Uber Eats charge these big commission percentages. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, yeah, you're, you're screwing over the restaurant. You're also screwing over the consumer. Like They, they pay off the end of paying a bunch of, you know, additional fees, like, you know, small order fees, late fees, all this stuff. Um, so what we did was we said, hey, like, we know, at least during COVID, like, people are, are relatively planned out where they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need it to be as on time. We just need it to be at a specific time so people can plan out their meals. Mm -hmm. So what we do now is we do an order and a head system where you have to order an hour before you get your meal. Okay. And then there are certain delivery times throughout the day that you can get it. 
Hmm. So these delivery times are catered around class schedules at Colgate. So students and faculty can get it, you know, at 12 o'clock in between classes, at two o'clock in between classes, hmm. and then at four, and then later into the afternoon for, for their lunch and their dinner. And that way we're only, you know, doing five or six delivery slots, as we call them. Um, but those slots, one, you only need one driver to do them. Yeah. And two, that one driver can efficiently take up all the, the restaurants in town and then go up to campus and then drop off all the orders. Hmm. So it's not, you know, pick up an order, drop it off, pick up and back. So this kind of grouping model is, is where we were able to kind of save a lot of, of, our, of our costs. And then with that money that we saved, we can give the restaurants all the money that we think they deserve. Yeah. Yeah. So as the customer, I place the order and I say, all right, these are the restaurants that, ex- that deliver through the platform mm-hmm. and I can get it delivered in these different time slots, mm-hmm. but I have to have my order in within an hour in advance. Yeah. And then the, now does the driver deliver it to me, to my dorm mm-hmm. or to the class or wherever? Or is there like a drop off location? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. That's so our, our model in my junior year, so 20, fall of 2020 and spring of 2021, was we'd go to every single location across campus. Um, it's efficient for a couple reasons. If you're like looking at a place like Syracuse or if you're in New York, like, yeah, like you don't have central locations really that where you can do it. In the, in the school at like Hamilton, that the campus is a quarter of a mile in radius. Mm. Students don't care about, you know, getting out of their bed and walking a thousand steps to get their meals. Yeah. Um, so what we did is is we changed it. So we have a couple central locations and like big hubs around campus okay. and we purchased uh, food lockers. So this was something that we reinvested a lot of our profits back into, which are like these big high tech lockers. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way it works from our end is. Uh, as soon as an order is placed, it automates a text to whoever's driving for that period. They'll get a QR code. They scan it. And the locker will pop open when they deliver it. They drop it in. As soon as it closes, it automates a text to the consumer. Mm-hmm. So then they'll come up. It's temperature controlled. It's locked. It's secure. They scan their, their, their code, and then they can take their meal and go out. So mm-hmm. this central model is, is also what allowed us to kind of do deliveries with only an hour gap of wait time because when we first launched we were doing day in advance ordering mm. um and that is it worked for covid because we had like a two-week quarantine where we couldn't leave our rooms when we first got back to campus mm. which <laughs> was terrible it was it was like we were like prisoners um but that model worked for for that time because everyone knew where they were going to be and then as covid restrictions changed we had to adapt with them yeah yeah that's wild. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so right now, and forgive me, but right now, so it's dropped off either in the lockers or delivered to their door, or now it's just dropped off in the lockers? It's just in the lockers. Just in the lockers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and how many lockers do you all have on campus? Right now, we have four lockers. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it may not seem like a lot, but between, like, the, the central locations on campus, um, it's kind of hitting all the spaces we need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And so, plans for the future are to expand to more locations. Um, so right now we're hitting majority students. That's our big demographic. A couple professors and faculty. And then the main thing we're looking forward to get into is uh, athletics. And, you know, playing soccer at Colgate, the trainers and the coaches that work, especially the trainers, are just like angels on earth. Like they mm-hmm. come to, to the, the university at like 6 a.m. and will be there until 10 p.m. some days. Yeah. And oftentimes they just bring like one like lunchbox or something. Mm. So that's a demographic that we're like, okay, these people like really need us. Yeah. Um, and so we're working out one locations where we can deliver to them and two, look at a different pricing model mm-hmm. because we want to find out ways that we can kind of pro- provide the meals without maybe some of the additional costs that like some students would have to pay. Yeah. Yeah. So how does the how does it work for a restaurant in Hamilton who wants to join uh, on the program? I'm really fucking excited about this, by the way. I'm trying not to smile, but I'm really fucking excited about Let's this. Go. Yeah, um, yeah, just like operational, like how we work them through our, our pipeline, or yeah, like uh, so. There's you know, let's say it's the Hamilton Eatery, right? Yeah. Uh, so you want to get you know uh, the Hamilton Eatery on the on the program. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? I know that they're on there now already, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, great question. Eatery is awesome. That's like if you, yeah. if, if for everyone listening, if you ever go to Colgate University, <laughs> go to the Hamilton Eatery. It's a great spot. Great people that work there. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that we had to do was the initial pitch, and so like I said, because food delivery has this notion around it of these commission models, we were initially greeted with some backlash and just some pushback. Mm-hmm. So we had to go to these restaurants and say, hey, like no. 
we're actually benefiting you. Like this is going to help your business out. You're going to be able to reach more customers. And we're like, it's zero risk for you because we're not charging any commission or any flat fee, nothing from you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so once getting them through the door and kind of changing the mindset, um, then we kind of go through a pitch deck of like, hey, if you do this many orders and this long, like this, how much money you can make mm -hmm. um, working through us, what we've done for other restaurants in the past. So currently right now we've done over $65,000 in sales okay. um, in really two full semesters. We didn't operate last fall because of athletics and abroad stuff for students. But um, this spring we've only been operating for the past month. And, and yeah, in that time, 65K in sales and the majority of that goes to the restaurants. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the pitch itself isn't too difficult um, once the, the restaurant owners are on your side. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been the biggest difficulty because like we were saying earlier, there are some people that um, like are a little bit in the past in, in regards to like food tech and, and right. what is offered right now, especially when you get to like a rural place like Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's, you know, everything from onboarding their, their meals and their prices and then doing like marketing stuff for them on our website and doing promo deals and, and everything through that pipeline. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's tough. I can say from, you know, working with a lot of restaurants in Syracuse, um, just how much SU uh, and, you know, ESF and LeMoyne, but especially SU uh, impacts their business. Mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of them in the summertime, they take a big hit because um, not just because we live in a great, you know, area in upstate New York where people travel on the weekends in a place like downtown, it can be a ghost town because most people, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people have lake houses and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it becomes kind of a ghost town because all, you know, those students are gone. students, yeah, leave. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's, if it's bad here, it's tenfold in, in Hamilton because yeah. the whole town is based around the university. Mm -hmm. And that's why COVID hit even harder for those people because they're not like the majority of their consumer base, their entire consumer base left. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's like, you know, we are seeing these GoFundMes and these restaurants closing down. It just hurts. Like it's, you, you, you're, you build these relationships with restaurant owners for a while and you kind of build them into your schedule. It just sucks seeing them, seeing them leave. And like, they're, they're really good people that are up in Hamilton. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what this whole thing was rooted in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's the industry that can, is really tied to uh, the, the colleges. Around here, you know, not many of the, uh, I don't know of any of the, of the restaurants, unless they're located on campus, um, which SU is a different story. They have a lot of, you know, great restaurants and food businesses that are on campus up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking about before, the, before we started recording, I've, you know, taught out at Casanova. Casanova is a tiny, tiny school, mm -hmm. obviously. But... Uh, besides the restaurants that are in town, which are on campus, essentially, because it's right there in yeah. the village, uh, you know, the food that the students have access to on campus is awful, like the dining hall. It's terrible. You know, it's, you know so um, especially this past year, there was like the dining hall at Casanova kept failing health inspections. And kids <laughs> oh, were, Jesus. I had a student who kept getting <laughs> sick for like the first two months of the semester from eating at the dining hall. So it is yeah. tough, but uh, a lot of these restaurants, they don't know how to, they're just like, a lot of them are saying to themselves, unless you're an exo taco that like we were talking about yeah. a lot of college kids go to, mm -hmm. or unless you're up there in direct proximity in the campus, a lot of the restaurants that are nearby are saying, well, how do I target the students up at SU or insert any college? I don't know how to. Definitely. And, um, and this is, you know, a great way to do that. Yeah. I mean, I also hate to laugh, but like dining hall food, you're eating like squishy hot dogs. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's not fine dining. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's sometimes not even edible like you were talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's very important. And the restaurants that we found have the most success are the ones that can market to that consumer base. And it's, it's one having the wherewithal to know like, okay, my main consumers are going to be college students. Mm -hmm. And then what can I do to kind of get those people on my side? And so, um, what some restaurants we've seen around Hamilton doing is like kind of bringing on, I wouldn't call them brand ambassadors, but mm -hmm. I like bringing on younger students to work for them so yeah. that they can kind of have an ear to the ground. And I think that's just brilliant. And I think if you don't do that, you can often fall behind and not know what your main consumer base is thinking about your business. Um, and that I also think is like a big benefit of what, what we, what we provide. And like if Uber eats or, you know, even like a, a zero commission 
uh, food delivery service, which I'm not sure any other exist, mm -hmm. were to come to Hamilton, they don't know like what the daily life of a student is, how right. that's built around class schedules, and like how that they can work with with the people around the school, around the university, and then around the um, around the town and, and with the restaurant. So yeah. we have this like unique take on on how this little bubble works mm -hmm. and what makes it tick. Um, and yeah, we've tried to leverage that to, to not only build our business, but like to help out the town and, and the, the, the village as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. It's a village by the way, not, it's not a town. That's what they call it. The village of Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so a restaurant joins, so mm -hmm. you contact a restaurant, you say, Hey, listen, don't, don't hang up. I've got this great <laughs> delivery platform. I can get you directly to students. It's not going to cost you a dime. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what do you say? They sign up mm -hmm. and okay, so they're on. So they just, and they, now do you like mark the menu up and then take a percentage from that? Or is it just regular priced menu? Yeah, that's, that's where we're making our money to kind of pay for our drivers, to pay our internal people, mm -hmm. to do like these software subscriptions for bubble. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do a, a slight increase of, of the price yeah. of the menu onto our website and then we take a, a delivery fee as well. Okay. Um, and so those two combined allow us to kind of remain operational yeah. um, without screwing over the restaurants. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What's the delivery fee? It's 15%. Oh, really? That's it? Yeah, no, it's not bad at all. Um, it's 15%, um, and then we're going to include the option of tips going forward. That's something we want to experiment with a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, just because our, our drivers are, are great people as well, and they've been yeah. huge just because it's not like – we're not just contracting like people that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Like this, the, our drivers started with like a, a base of like our friends and the people we know. And, and honestly, when we first launched, like I said, all the students were quarantined for two weeks, like not allowed to leave your dorm. There was an hour of, they called it recess time, <laughs> that you were able to leave and do whatever you want. Other than that, you were like mandated to stay in, in your house. <laughs> um, and so you're like, oh, if you want to la launch like a food delivery, it's great for the consumers. Like they're going to eat that up because they were delivering dining hall food to them. And hmm. God knows no one wants to eat that. But we needed to find drivers. So we worked with the people at the Hamilton Inn. Um, and Michael's, if you yeah. know Michael's Food and Spirit, yeah, he, he runs, that's the Hamilton Inn as well. And, and they were just instrumental in getting us off the ground because they had these two huge vans mm -hmm. that had heat bags in them. And we were doing, you know, 50, 60, 70 orders a day. Wow. Yeah, like really, really high volume, low frequency, but high volume. Hmm. And they were a perfect fit for us then. So, hmm. um, yeah, they, they helped us get off the ground a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's... Um yeah, I'm familiar with uh, them, uh, Hamilton Eatery, mm -hmm. uh, Fojo, uh, and unfortunately, Ryberry Bakery. Uh, RIP. Who, yeah. Um, Fojo isn't, but the others, they're all on our Eat Local card. So, you know, and uh, so I'm, I'm out there maybe once or twice a year. Totally. Um, yeah, the Ryberry Bakery, that had the, they had the best, yeah. best everything. What do you think of, like, Hamilton as a whole? And the town, because it is it's pretty quaint. Yeah, I like Hamilton. I do. It's yeah. uh, it's cool to see. I mean, you know, it's interesting to see um, how much uh, rallies around a college, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hamilton probably w it wouldn't exist if it weren't for, you know, Colgate. Yeah. Right? So In the same way, at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of those kind of, you know, towns and villages out in, you know, places like that. I mean, Casanova is kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like Hamilton. Uh, you get out into some of those spots and, you know, you just, people never know that those things exist unless they drive through them oh, or God. they're You're going not expecting there. it at all. No, not they're at all. You're going through, like, farm country, cows left and right, and then, boom, like a huge college town kind of pops up out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And there's cool, I mean, the rye berry was phenomenal. Flour and salt's great. Mm -hmm. um, Fojo Beans is really cool, you yeah. know, coffee shop, Definitely. cafe for what it, you know. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Flower and Salt's moving into Ryberry's old location. Are they really? Yeah, they're expanding. Wow. Yeah, so they um, they opened up a, a, a bar as well mm. on the other side of Hamilton. Other side meaning like yeah. a quarter of a mile away. Okay. Um, but yeah, they opened a bar and it has like an attached like deli to it. Oh, um, wow. Really interesting. Yeah, so they're, they're, per our earlier conversation, killing it with marketing towards like students. Yeah. So Brittany is, is a Colgate grad. They also went through the incubator, the okay. Colgate incubator. Um, and they just really know like what makes like 
students tick and like what we want and what we're looking for and, and they've capitalized on it and they're doing a great job yeah yeah it's um you know it's it's funny kind of talking about like you talking about reaching out to restaurants out there and they're kind of first they're gun shy it's like no we don't want to do we don't want to pay the fee or whatever mm-hmm. um we so with our eat local card um it's free for restaurants to join yeah. um and we have 165 that we work with across the state um, but all they have to do is if a customer comes in with and shows their card, if they spend $25 or more, they get, the customer gets $5 off their bill. Um, uh, but it's free for restaurants to join and then we promote them and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And there are some spots that are just like, nope, we're not going to do it. Um, you know, and then there's some that are like, this is amazing. I can't yeah. believe it's free. So I try to understand like the reasoning of the psychology behind the people that just say flat out no to that. Yeah. Like, is it not like, cause I feel like once you hear that out, like mm-hmm. it's, you can't lose. Right. Um, but like, like, yeah, I just feel like some people are very set in their ways. Yeah. Um, and the way that, you know, any business, especially the food delivery or the, just the restaurant business in general is if you stay like that and you don't adapt, like you'll fall behind quick. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not what you want. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, I, I don't know what the mindset is. I think, uh, um, part of it is just, it's, there is, there are a lot of like old school people in there. Um, I mean, I'm a partner in a restaurant now and there are, it's, it's really easy. Like if you're, uh, once you're in there, you're in there, like mm-hmm. the outside world doesn't exist. If you're a restaurant <laughs> owner, like the, t- the hours that you're in there, that's all you're focused on thinking yeah. about. And if it's not something that you directly need, it's like, yeah, go fuck yourself. Here, there's no yeah. way you're gonna get my attention right now. Margins are razor thin for most restaurants. Yeah, so it's like, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> our, so this I w- is what they've told us. So maybe, <laughs> maybe they're saying that because no, we're coming at them trying to sell them something. And they are. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, the the you know, there's a few different things I've heard, um, and it depends on what you sell, obviously. Yeah. You know, the usually like. You know, the nicer the food, the more expensive, obviously, it is. Um, and your best margins are going to be found in, like, pizzerias and, you know, diners and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, flour and eggs and potatoes. Those are all your cheapest things to buy. Right. But if I can be completely transparent, I mean, uh, and hopefully my partner doesn't listen to this episode and doesn't get pissed off at me. We, we can cut it out. This is off the air. Cut, they won't no, know. I won't cut this out. <laughs> I mean, I hear it too, how expensive food is and how ex- more expensive it's gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, we just, like, so, you know, 3-1 fried, fried chicken sandwiches. We have five really great fried chicken sandwiches on our menu, and we focus on just delivery and takeout. Mm-hmm. Um, we sell the sandwiches for between, like, 12 and $15, and the most expensive sandwich on the menu, our cost, including the takeout container, is three dollars and fifty cents. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's absurd. Now that's not now that's not factoring in labor and rent and right. all those other costs. But is it also are you going with like a kind of ghost kitchen model where you're not hosting anyone like you said it's just delivery and takeout? So we're we're different because um, there's a famous barbecue place in town called limp lizard Mm -hmm. and they have three locations um and i'm friends with nick who's one of the owners of it Mm -hmm. and um and so they have one of their locations it's just been slow um i helped there's a ghost kitchen that opened up in the beginning of covid called mad burger Mm -hmm. um the owner hired me to create the name and do the branding and the Mm -hmm. logo and Mm -hmm. their marketing um, and they were a ghost kitchen, but they were only open for two weeks before shutting down because of staffing issues. Oh, jeez. Uh, but anyway, so I helped build that. And so he came to me and he was just like, we're slow up here. Why don't we kind of try and figure out a ghost kitchen concept and we can do it together? Mm-hmm. So I've had the idea for the name 3-1 Fried for like five years. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's sick. Originally, I wanted it to be like a hipster bone-in fried. Like I wanted to do like a hipster take on like, a family goes and gets a bucket of chicken and beer and goes home. Yeah. And, um, but uh, that's, a uh, that's a fucking task to do bone and fried <laughs> chicken. Well, yeah. So Maybe five years from now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, let's just do really great fried chicken sandwiches. So that's what we did. Totally. So, but we operate inside of their existing restaurant. It's their staff. Oh. 
Um, okay. On just with through and fried locally or bringing it, in like menu. logos on, yeah. on that. Okay, right. interesting. So their staff now is cooking two menus at the same time. We're open almost the same hours. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the same cashier, you know, people at the counter are still taking the same orders. It's two different POS systems. Yeah. And What's the other restaurant? What kind of food is it? It's all barbecue. So do they have a fried chicken sandwich as well? They do. Is and it exactly the same? You know, it wasn't the same, <laughs> but now it is the same. Because people like through and fry. They want to get that over there. Yeah, people like it. And it's like, okay, if I'm going to have two fried chicken sandwiches on, you know, two different menus, I'm not going to cook them two different ways. Okay. Because that's what they were doing. Are you, you charging know? them a commission? Uh, to do the food? No. <laughs> so this is kind of where it works out great. And I'll, I'll be surprised. I won't be surprised when more restaurants do it. But, you know, for Limp Lizard to exist, they they own their building, which is unique. But mm-hmm. they have the building, they have the staff, they have the equipment, they have all the space. So now they're just adding another menu. Right. Um, and and a little bit different food, but just adding a new menu. Okay. And um, so now for that restaurant, they have their income from Limp Lizard, and then now they also have their other revenue from Through and Fried. So... Um, and we're doing almost matching business. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it's like super beneficial for them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a direct, but essentially they've doubled their business right. by having this restaurant. And you if know? you're not incurring costs from getting like all new product in, like right. if it's relatively transferable, what you guys are doing, yeah. then, um, yeah, or at least like who they're importing or getting it from. Right. Yeah. I mean, you still counts. have to, it is some of its, uh, most of its different product. Okay. Um, you know, like we only do tater tots. They didn't do tater mm-hmm, tots. Like mm-hmm. we do different rolls than they do. Um, different buns, you know, different chicken. Is it different suppliers as well? No, it's the same supplier. Okay. Yeah. So then that, yeah, makes it a little better. Like These are some like tricks that restaurants em- implore to save money. Like I know one restaurant owner in town who... He has a diner, and every week he will take his inventory list and shop it around to every food supplier that exists. Mm. And if he can save a nickel by switching f- suppliers from one week to the other, like he orders eggs from Renzi this week, next week Cisco is cheaper, he orders from Cisco that week. Really? So that's one way to fr- restaurants can save money. It's a lot of time and effort. I was effort. about to say, is the labor worth it, you know? if. For him, it is because he's the one, you know, if you had to hire somebody, you know, pay somebody an hourly rate to do that, probably okay. not. But the other way that restaurant owners can save money is to say, I'm going to sign a contract. I'm only ordering from Renzi. Mm. Like, you, like, I'm never going to order from Cisco or JFS or anybody. I'm only ordering everything forever from Renzi. When you do that, you know, they will, you know, kick you some stuff. Sometimes yeah. it's in the form of a check up front sometimes it's like here's you know a few percent you know percentage points off your order Mm -hmm. whatever the case is there's different ways that you can structure stuff um but uh but yeah i mean so it's uh you know so we don't have the uh we don't have a full rent payment you know like a normal restaurant would we don't have a full you know staff you know payroll um like a normal restaurant would like essentially these two restaurants are splitting the cost of everything. Yeah. You know, um, no, it's a super good idea. I'm surprised more, more restaurants don't do that. Or maybe they do. And we just don't know that they're coming out of that kitchen. It's starting to build up around here. There's, um, actually the place that won the taco contest Mm -hmm. to Sierra Algo. That's a virtual kitchen that operates inside of another restaurant. Interesting. So Danny steaks, the owner, which is just down around the corner, mm-hmm. the owner of Danny Steaks started Desir Algo. That's just tacos. That's just takeout and delivery inside yeah. the same kitchen. So yeah, and then there's some global brands doing it, like the you know right. look like the Wow Bows or the mm. Mr. Beast Burger, like yeah. what he does there too. Yeah, I mean, and that's like kind of rats back to the theme of this conversation. Was like, yeah, that works, and it's new tech that's like really changing. And a lot of consumers are getting used to it quick. Right. And if you don't adapt, like those ones will kind of get big and, and take you out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Funk and Waffles down the street, they actually have multiple restaurants, virtual kitchens inside of their kitchen. They own all of them, mm. but they've got like a breakfast burrito place, a breakfast sandwich place. Um, and there's like two other concepts all within Funk and Waffles. They don't market it. Mm-hmm. It only exists on Grubhub and DoorDash. Um, if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't know that it's them. Yeah. 
Um, there's no f Instagram page that they have. It's just, you know, that. Um, and there's restaurants in New York City. There's a famous, there's a diner in New York City. There's tw they have 20 different restaurants out of their one kitchen. Wow. 19 of them are delivery only, and one of them is the diner that you can walk into and eat at. Huh. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah. So are you guys operating through Uber Eats Grubs? Or, wow, Uber Eats Grubhub? Yeah, so we are on Grubhub and DoorDash. Uber Eats has been a pain in the ass to get on to. Yeah, they suck. Um, and for some reason, they just won't accept. Like, they keep saying, you're in, we're processing your, you know, mm. request. But, uh, yeah, so on the other two, for sure. And maybe coming up, we'll have to do gate grubs up in Syracuse. Yeah. Syracuse snacks or something like right. that. Yeah. It would yeah. work. Um, do you know the, uh, there's the, there is a famous restaurant in Brooklyn that does that, that does like the same, uh, not does that, but does the same locker system. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Have you, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. I right have there. it. I know it's, it's starting to expand to other college campuses as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good idea. Um, you also get like a lot of data that you can track from it as well to like get some more insight on your consumers and when they're ordering, where they're ordering from, all this stuff that, that really can help out your business. Yeah. Um, so, when, like, how did you guys come up with the idea for it? For the locker? Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting connection. We had, we had been thinking about ways to optimize, um, like, the delivery routes. Um, and then this, this like, central location idea just kind of came up in conversation. And coincidentally enough, uh, the um, chief growth officer for the company that we ended up using, Apex Food, food Delivery, yeah. or Food Technology, he emailed me and was like, hey, I saw what you're doing at Colgate. I'd love to like talk about a partnership. Hmm. So without us doing any outreach to them, we already got them on board. And yeah, I kind of went from there. Yeah. yeah. So this is, it's called the, what is it? The Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dumpling Shop. And um, you know what? I have seen this. Okay. And there were like lines out the door. Like yeah. it's a crazy popular. Yeah. So um, I'll put a link to the YouTube video or their website in the yeah. show notes for anybody listening. But essentially there's, you can't, you walk in, you, you order from a tablet. You can't order from a person, uh, which is fine. And, um, uh, you know, the staff, there's a kitchen staff that's making the food. They have like this wall of heated lockers. Yeah. They put the food in a numbered locker. We give you the QR, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You scan it as the customer, and yeah. And, and these then, are all, they're all backloaded lockers, which yeah. is different than what we do. So the, the right. kitchen puts it right in there. Yeah. But with us, the front facing locker will open up, our driver will drop it off, and the consumer will take it from there. Yeah. That's the guy. He's been in like, uh, that's the owner. He's been on like CNN and Fox and like all this. Like they got a lot of attention um, from doing this. Uh, but yeah, they're in Brooklyn and that's like what they focus on is just that stuff. It's like you can't really go in and sit down and, and just order. Yeah. You know? I'd be curious to see like the... Wow, I'll look at all those locations. Oh, that's crazy. I wonder... Oh, all, all coming oh, they're all coming to... What's the point of putting them all on there? <laughs> oh, that's fucking hilarious. Oh, that's such a tease. You should do that. Oh my God. <laughs> you yeah, should yeah. do that. <laughs> Syracuse, LA, Cas, all these places coming to... Eventually. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, for everybody listening, there's like f there's three. You click on locations. There's three locations, and then there's like twenty more that all say coming soon next to them, mm -hmm. uh, and they're all over the country: Atlanta and Dallas and Miami. That's hilarious. Next time we have an order that is running a little late, I'll just put that in there. Coming, yeah, coming, coming soon. soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that's pretty funny. I don't know. I've been I've been wanting to go down there, and because uh, they do like you know I think not only their system and their process of like, you know, um, of, you know, automating and making it simple and contactless and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but they do like pastrami dumplings and oh, you know, like, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Stuff with it. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, you know, honestly in developing three, one fried, um, I mean, we had the name, but we didn't have like the logo or anything like that. And mm -hmm. so, but developing it, like we spent, once we decided that's it, we're going to go with that concept. We spent about four months uh, collectively, me at home, figuring out the recipe. Um, you know, do we want to do a chicken thigh, chicken breast? Mm -hmm. Do we pound the chicken breast out? What size chicken breast do we do? Like, do we brine it? You know, all, all right, those different right, things. Right, right. And then in a kitchen, like in their commercial kitchen that Limp Lizard has, 
and then figure out the sandwich. You know, so it took us a while. Definitely. And then the branding, how, how long did the branding aspect of that take? Not long. And yeah. honestly, we need to do a lot. We should have done a lot more with it. I mean, I mean, I, is that the main logo that you guys have on the yeah. shirt? Yeah. No, it looks cool. I like it. Yeah. I love the logo. Yeah. It's sick. Um, it was, I mean, Fiverr. You know, I got this for a hundred bucks. Oh yeah? Yeah. There you go. All right. You can find some good people on Fiverr. Yeah. For just sure. not, just not web developers because oh, they'll, really? <laughs> they'll eat away at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most web developers. Will. Most, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want some some passionate people. Yeah, um, but uh, I mean, so but it took us, you know, the longer aspect, and we had some ideas for mm-hmm. it. Like um, we do, we'd put thank you cards. So we had a system; it fell apart very quickly. But we had this system of thank you cards in everybody's order, mm-hmm. and so they were color coded, and they, it was a different sandwich. So. Um, if somebody ordered, we gave them one card that said, you know, on the front, thanks so much for ordering. We appreciate you supporting a small business, you know, yada, yada, yada. On the back, it said, if you enjoyed your sandwich, reviews are so important. Please leave us a review on Facebook or Google or totally. Yelp. Yeah. And it said, if you had a, if your experience could have been better, here's the owner's cell phone number in it, my cell phone. Yeah. Call me and tell me what we could have done better. Wow. Um, and so we had postcard A, B, and C. So, and it, oh, I'm sorry, it also gave 10% off their next visit. Okay. So, um, if they brought in on their first visit, they got the white postcard. Mm-hmm. If they brought that back and redeemed it, we knew this was their second visit. So, we gave them the orange postcard. And it was a different sandwich for the same discount mm-hmm. and said all the same stuff. Yeah. And then if they brought that back, then we knew it was their second visit. So, we gave them, or their third visit rather. So, we gave them a third uh, blue postcard. Mm. So, cause the concept is if you can get somebody back into your restaurant four times, you've got an 80% chance. Like they're going to be long lasting repeat customers. Right. Yeah. You know, you come into my restaurant for the first time, I've got a 20% chance you're going to come back. Right. You know, second time it bumps up third time it bumps up. So that was the concept there. Cause then once you get them through, then your, your conversion rates good. Like you got them in right. they're hooked essentially and they, they yeah. build you into the routine. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It's huge. It's something that we found like a lot of people will, will, will kind of be like one off orders is what we call them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the people that, that are, have really been like carrying our business are people that like build gate grubs into their daily routine Yeah, where they know, Hey, for lunch every day, I'm ordering gate grubs for dinner every day. Mm-hmm. And you'll see like these orders come in like, like clockwork. Yeah. Um, and that consumer base that we have are, is something that we're trying to like expand out more into mm-hmm. and like cherish and like try and like gratify them. So yeah. something we did was we, with the lockers that, that we were talking about, we put one of our hoodies in there mm-hmm. and we said, Hey, if you, um, you know, place an order, we'll drop the code that opens the locker and you mm-hmm. can get a free hoodie from there. Um, and it ended up being, it was random and, and one of our kind of usual repeat customers got it and been ordering like almost every day since so yeah once you can get those people i think that that's like yeah that's the way to go (laughs) yeah for sure yeah i i heard an interesting stat that like the average consumer only has space in their life for like six or seven brands Hmm. um and so you know that they like consistently visit um i don't know if that's accurate or not i know people eat out a shit i mean the average American eats out like seven meals a, a week, mm-hmm. um, at, like going out, whether it's, you know, breakfast, lunch or dinner, or sitting down or delivery or takeout or whatever. Yeah. So they're spending a lot of money on food for sure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my wife is like everyone's demographic. She's, you know, in her mid thirties, white, uh, college educated, has a good job. So, you know, she falls in line with pretty much <laughs> any product that you're going to sell. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, she hates like if we order pizza she hates calling them she knows grubhub is more expensive Mm -hmm. she but they have her credit card information saved she can open up her phone tap a few buttons and she's done Mm -hmm. she doesn't want to have to call the restaurant up place the order pull out her credit card all that kind of stuff yeah she'll gladly pay more for an easier experience. And those little things that have kind of changed the way that she functions when she's ordering food, build up that brand loyalty. Mm -hmm. So if you're like the first brand, if you're the Grubhub there, then you have, even if you know, a Uber Eats does the same service and maybe more restaurants, you're loyal subconsciously or not, like you're, you're loyal to what you have. Um, And yeah, I think, I think the brand model, like for restaurants, people want variety and they want to be able to try a bunch of new things, yeah. but the systems that we do. So like whenever you're thinking of, um, I'm going to get a new pair of shoes 
early, like you're going to go Nike. I want to get, you know, yeah. food delivered, like those systems. That's where you can have like those couple brands. And that's kind of what we've tried to be for Colgate, yeah. which is, hey, as soon as anyone thinks food, um, if they don't want to move, think it grubs. And that's just mm-hmm. like the guerrilla marketing, like, <laughs> like <laughs> stuff that we've been doing around campus is like, you can't turn a corner without like seeing a poster or a locker or mm-hmm. like seeing our ad on, on Instagram targeted ads. Like we're like in everyone's face all the time. Um, and there's also really no other competition. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, I think that the, the way to go is, especially in like a town like Hamilton, it's like yeah. you just can hammer it down until you get those, those returning customers. Yeah. yeah. Is there, is good uncle, is there, well, is good, is good uncle out there? Yeah. Good uncle okay. is out there. I don't consider them a competitor per se because they make their own food. And they, I think they're, the way they do it is they ship frozen food in their trucks and they keep, they have fridges there. And then when someone orders, they pop it in a microwave or some kind of heating device. Mm. Um, yeah, it's good. Not great. It's yeah. very expensive. Um, and you also like don't help out any restaurants while doing it. So, yeah. yeah. That, when that launched in Syracuse, I forget how many years ago, like four or five years ago, that was a big deal. Like people... You know, the pitch was you can get, hey, college student, you can get your favorite pizza from New York City from back home or wherever, deli- you know, here in Syracuse. And mm-hmm. um, and they had like a big push for a, like a few months for marketing. And then I never heard anything else from them. But I see their vans around town every once in a while. Yeah, they fly around town. Our, <laughs> our like friends um, boycott good uncle in, <laughs> in favor of us. Yeah, so... Um, the, the people that work for the good uncle vans, I will say are very nice. We have a good relationship with them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of our nemesis in town. So we yeah. have like a, like a playful thing in our team where we poke fun at them. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not delivering food for other local restaurants, right? No, no. They make all their own food and they are not allowed to kind of really be on campus. They kind of hang on the roads outside of campus okay. and you have to walk to their vans and take the food from there. That's crazy. Yeah. So weird. it's like, it's like what they tell you in, when you're a kid growing up is like <laughs> the opposite of what you should be doing. Like don't go to a stranger's van and take stuff from them. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and there's no Grubhub or DoorDash or anything out there, right? No, none. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's something that we always talked about when I was um, like a first year and a sophomore was like, why is there no Uber Eats? Why is there no Grubhub? And then I, I remember always thinking like, someone started this thing. Like it would be killer. Like yeah. this is a business that could work here. Um, and my drawback to it always was like, there are some very like serious people doing this thing and, and it would take a lot of time and effort. Yeah. And I didn't think I had the time with, with soccer and school and other activities. And then during COVID, I was like, you know what? Like, this is something I've always wanted to explore. Now, if there's any time that I'm going to be able to, to be able to, to put effort into this, it would be now. Um, and I also think it was kind of wrong for me to think that in those first years I couldn't have been doing something like this because mm-hmm. I mean things have been even more hectic for me since, yeah, okay. um, even outside of gay grubs. So you can always find time for something that you have a passion in. So mm-hmm. for for me, it was kind of finding the thing that I can like sink my teeth into. So that I know when I get up in the morning, like it's the first thing, oh, like this is going to be my goal for the day with Geekrobs. This is what I can build out. And this is how I can like kind of find a purpose in it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so what is, uh, I mean, what is, well, I want to ask you about the lockers uh, and then I want to get to the, the final question. But oh so, uh, how much were the, I mean, where, well, where did you all buy the lockers? And they're expensive, right? They are expensive. Um, so they're from Apex Food Delivery Technologies. Okay. Um, shout out Apex. Did you, is people. that the manufacturer? Or is that the supplier? Um, that is the supplier. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we worked very closely with them, started communication back in like October, November. Um, hmm. and we were going back and forth with deals for around like five, six months. Yeah. Um, the, the street value of the locker, if you just look on the website, it's around $10,000 for a locker. And that locker is, is it four or eight? Uh, it's seven positions, oh, seven, okay. seven positions. And then one like control slot where okay. you would scan. Um, and so we worked out a deal to kind of get a little discount there, mm. providing with them with some marketing, like the, the ad that you saw. Yeah. Um, and then some other things that kind of would provide like just some market testing for them because mm-hmm. they're looking to expand into more college towns and, and schools similar to Colgate. So they could use it a little bit as like a, a use case to be like, Hey, 
how beneficial is it for our business to go to Colgate and then hmm. vice versa helped us out. So yeah, we still had to pay a good amount for it, but um, not yeah. as much as the street value. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And you have four of them? Uh, three. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So uh, what's the plan after this? Cause you're graduating, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah. It's a heavy hidden question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, all three of you are right. Uh, yeah. All three founders are graduating. So we, we, we sat back at the beginning of the semester, like there are two paths this business could take. Well, three technically. The first being we operate the semester and it fizzles out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we say, hey, made some good money, um, did some good things, you know, put some stuff on a resume. The second was we can invest everything and try and find someone to like take this over mm -hmm. um, from like an acquisition standpoint. So like someone that just comes in and buys the business, yeah. like a third party, and then we, you know, make a little chunk of change and then the business is just in their hands. Yeah. And the third was we can pass this down to Colgate students who understand the problem and are invested. Mm -hmm. And that was what was most appealing and exciting just because this is going to be something that's going to be like living and breathing and we got to choose the people to take it over. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our main priorities was onboarding. So, you know, we put up like handshake profiles and built, you know, our company profile on LinkedIn and have been doing interviews all throughout the year. And we started onboarding um, Ellie McDermott and Stan Keith, who are two underclassmen up at Colgate. Um, and they've just been amazing. So mm -hmm. they joined in small, small roles, like just doing our driver relations, even just a part of that, and just doing our marketing. And they have blossomed into like mm -hmm. these just amazing, very smart mind and entrepreneurial people who like to be brutally honest, I didn't like expect that they would produce like the, the utility that they ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they've, they've take the business kind of onto their own. And then the way we're planning like an exit strategy for us is this summer, we're going to keep building our team. Uh, we're onboarding a couple more people right at the, after graduation, looking forward to the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we will be on in the summer. And then as we start our jobs later mm -hmm. on after school, um, we're going to kind of be like consultants. So like, okay. If they need to, you know, set up an hour long, like talk about how things are going and they can work with us. But um, the main focus was to bring good people in who are passionate and then optimize the system so that they don't have to build it from the ground up again. They can kind of just manage and then focus on some some growth strategy yeah. stuff. Yeah. So will you all stay on like stay in the business as the owners or pass on that ownership to them? We've passed on a little bit of equity to okay. the, the two people coming on. Uh, we still have majority equity in the company. Um, and then right now we're incentivizing with kind of like a profit split. So like depending on how much money we make, um, like some of that goes to different people in the business. And then with chances to like make more equity the longer you stay in. But yeah. the, like, the nature of like a college business is there's just a, bit, a lot of turnaround. Yeah, so sure. you, you got to put an assistant to find new, like good talent every couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and some advice that I got that is very like relatable to this is like, you know, you want to hire like a star people, like a athletes because a athletes hire other a athletes yeah. where if you hire, you know, B athlete, B athletes hire C athletes yeah. and it keeps going down like that. So we really want to make sure the people that are doing our recruiting and doing our onboarding are, you know, the best, of, the best of the best. Mm -hmm. That way that the system can continue to live and breathe. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you pay the drivers or what do the drivers get paid? They actually make twenty dollars an hour right now, and that's kind of on the low end. Um, so the way that we have we're paying them is we're paying them um, ten dollars for a delivery slot. So we pay them ten dollars every time they pick up, you know, orders from around camp or from around town, and then drop off all the orders up the hill. Um, we came up with that because we are estimating it would take around half an hour. Um, it's honestly been shorter for some people sometimes mm. it takes them 15 20 minutes mm. and then they park the car and they go back to the library or whatever they were doing so um we're paying them their contract to drivers so they're not in our payroll yeah. um and they're like making good money on the side and, and they can th the benefit for them compared to like an uber eats where you have to be on call is you they schedule out for the entire next week mm. what the hours are on every day mm. um so they know in advance here's when i'm going to be driving um, and so say they do like five slots throughout the week, you know, that takes them maybe an hour and a half, two hours and they're making 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's super beneficial for students and we know students are busy. So we wanted to build a system that kind of catered towards them. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, so are there any plans to, uh, like, ex like, or, or any, or either three of you or any of you or all three of you planning on 
after you're done, you know, because you're all seniors, you're mm-hmm. all just going to be like, hey, I'm going to go back to D.C. and we're going to start this up at college campuses there. Yeah. Um, I definitely think there's a market where this can be done elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, small schools um, where the, the, the students are used to Uber Eats that come from or Grubhub that come from these places. Yeah. Um, and the restaurants, either they have Uber Eats and they're just getting screwed over um, or they don't have any system. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that we've been looking into just on like pure market research yeah um our main priority has been how can we scale this at colgate and Mm -hmm. really do a good job there and then maybe the there will be like a franchising opportunity or some kind of opportunity in the future to to look elsewhere yeah Yeah. well it's uh it's really cool man it's cool to hear to see something like new and exciting you know uh i mean is not that i'm not that we're up on every new trend or anything like that but uh um you know like eat local New York and working and with restaurants in Buffalo and Rochester and, you know, downstate and Hudson Valley and mm-hmm. New York city, you know, I'm a little bit more aware of like the food trends that are happening in mm-hmm. bigger cities. And I've always said yeah. central New York is about three or four years behind Buffalo and Buffalo is about five years behind New York city. <laughs> Hamilton's <laughs> even further back from that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, like we just launched, like we're, it, we're really the first, maybe we're not the first, we're one of the first restaurants to only do chicken, fried chicken sandwiches and just focus on that. Mm-hmm. SoFly obviously was one of the first in Syracuse, but um, we were just on local news this morning and they were saying the, you know, big food truck or the big uh, fried chicken sandwich trend is here and it's sweeping the nation. <laughs> Let's and, go. And I'm th- thinking to myself, it's been in Buffalo for three years. <laughs> like I like the people in Rochester and Buffalo have been doing this for the last three years are now done with it and moving on to the next thing. Yeah. And it's just hitting here. So it is really cool to see that, you know, you guys have started this in little Hamilton mm-hmm. that is on like right at the beginning of kind of the trend, you know? Definitely. Yeah. And I think that in terms of like expanding our vision, like even if this isn't something that, you know, we end up, or me personally, that I end up like pursuing like all the way down the road or if I don't stay on in some capacity. I think that more and more delivery companies are popping up, maybe not with a 0% commission model that we offer, but with something that's in between what we do and what Uber Eats is charging. Mm-hmm. And so I hope that the more and more companies that, that pop up and startups that are helping out the restaurants, they can kind of, you know, you know, tilt the needle a little bit in that direction. And then these big food delivery companies have to catch on in order to keep up or else they're going to lose all the restaurants. So yeah. it's kind of, you know, if we can, if we can provide a little bit of help there and then that helps restaurants in Hamilton and that spreads up all of up to New York and then across the country, like that is something that I can go to bed every night, like being really proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for driving all the way out here, especially if you're oh, yeah. ready for finals. To do this, <laughs> you know. I was uh, much more excited about this than my econ final. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet. Well, thank you so much, man. And uh, for everybody who's listening and watching, I'm going to have show- links in the show notes of places you can check them out on uh, the website, on their website, on social media. And uh, yeah, follow along and see what they're doing. Awesome. So, Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Yep.